Okay, hi there, everybody. Um, I am doing this recorded lecture for chapter 21 um, of our intermediate accounting textbook. Um, and as we will see as we go through the PowerPoints and then of course get practice with this in class together, um, chapter 21, we are talking about leases, um, leasehold agreements. And so from the leases uh, perspective, which is the person doing the leasing, uh, basically like, you know, if I lease uh, farm equipment or if I, um, you know, lease, you know, uh, assembly equipment for my factory or whatever, right? So I'm leasing the equipment and using it. Um, and so, um, we're at, you know, as we'll see from the leases perspective, it's either a capital lease uh, that we will capitalize or an operating lease that we will expense. From the leasor's perspective, um, and so the leasor, like, you know, again, if I am a farmer, and I rent or I lease farm equipment for to use on my farm. If I lease it from Caterpillar, then Caterpillar is the leaseor, right? And so from the leaseor's perspective, it's either an operating lease, um, a sales type lease, or a, a direct lease. And so we're going to look at, you know, the differences and examples um, of each of those. So I am going to get my... Um, share my screen with you and get the PowerPoint pulled up here. We can go over this together. And so um, chapter 21, accounting for leases. Again, some of the main um, learning objectives of this ch uh, chapter explain the nature, economic substance and advantages of lease transactions. Describe the accounting for leases by leasees. Um, describe the accounting for leases by leasors, describe the accounting and reporting for special features of lease arrangements. And so remember, the leasee, um, you know, is the individual that has the right to use specific property. So in the example of me being a farmer um, and leasing equipment to use from Caterpillar, then the leasee is the farmer renting slash leasing the equipment. And then the leasor then is, you know, whatever, John Deere or Caterpillar. Um, okay. And then learning objective four, again, describe the accounting and reporting for special features of lease arrangements. Okay. So the leasing environment a lease is a contractual agreement between a leasor and a leasee that gives the leasee the right to use specific property owned by the leasor for a specific period of time. So um, just like it talks about in our book, the largest group of leased equipment involves um, information technology equipment, computers, servers, things like that, um, transportation, uh, semi-trucks, aircrafts, uh, rail, uh, railroad cars or railway, railway cars, um, construction equipment, and then agricultural equipment. So some of the ad advantages of leasing that this book talks about, 100% um, financing at fixed rates. Um, leases are often, and I'm just looking at page 1198 right now on this, leases are often signed without requiring any money down from the leasee. This helps the leasee conserve scarce cash and especially desirable feature for new and developing companies. Um, in addition, lease payments often remain fixed, which protects the leasee against inflation and increases in the cost of money. Uh, number two, protection against obsolescence. Um, leasing equipment reduces risk of obsolescence to the leasee and in many cases passes the risk of residual value to the leasor. Um, and so if equipment becomes obsolete and it cannot be used anymore, the leasee can turn it back into the leasor, right? Um, so they have that protection against obsolescence. Uh, number three, flexibility. Um, this one in our book, it says lease agreements may contain less restrictive provisions than other debt agreements. Um, innovative leasors can tailor a lease agreement to the leasee's special needs. Um, for instance, 
the duration of the lease or the lease term may be anything from a short period of time to the entire expected economic life uh, of the asset. Uh, number four, less costly financing. Um, in our book, it says some companies find leasing cheaper than other forms of financing. For example, startup companies in depressed industries or companies in low tax brackets may lease to claim tax benefits that they might otherwise lose. Um, depreciation deductions offer no benefit to companies that have little, if any, taxable income. So uh, leasing and, and, and using the expense instead um, would, would afford us tax, um, tax benefits. Number five, tax advantages. It says in some cases, companies can have their cake and eat it too with tax advantages that leases offer. That is for financial reporting purposes, companies do not report an asset or a liability for the lease arrangement. For tax purposes, however, companies can capitalize and depreciate the leased asset. As a result, the company takes deductions earlier rather than later and also reduces its taxes. And then finally, number six, off balance sheet financing. Certain leases do not add debt on the balance sheet or affect financial ratios. In fact, they may add to borrowing capacity. Um, such off balance sheet financing is critical to some companies. Okay, so the conceptual nature of a lease, um, and it talks about this on page 1199. Um, Capitalize a lease that transfers substantially all of the benefits and risk of property ownership, provided the lease is non-cancelable. Um, and so remember, we said we're either going to say it's a capital lease or operating lease. And there are certain criteria that FASB um, has put forth to determine whether we call it a capital lease or an operating lease. But again, a capital lease that transfers substantially all of the benefits and risk of property ownership, um, provided that the lease is non cancelable uh, Leases that do not transfer substantially all of the benefits and risk of ownership are operating leases. So, you know, ca we capitalize a lease. Basically, if the leasee um, is you know, getting all of the benefits and also assuming the risk of property ownership. If the lease does not transfer the benefits and risk of ownership, then it's an operating lease, right? Okay, accounting by the leasee, and we're gonna look at it from both perspectives. We're gonna look at accounting by the leasee, uh, for example, if I'm the farmer, and then we're gonna look at accounting by the leasor, for example, if I'm John Deere or Caterpillar or whatever. Um, but it, at first, it walks us through accounting by the leasee. So it says, if the leasee capitalizes a lease, the leasee records an asset and a liability generally equal to the present value of the rental payments. Um, in this case, when we capitalize a lease, we do record depreciation on the leased asset, um, and we treat the lease payments as, you know, considering or consisting of um, interest and principal um, payment. So every time we make our lease payment, right, a portion of it is going to the principal, a portion of it is going to the interest um, type deal. And so journal entries for capitalized lease. So um, in our book, it gives us the example of Delta leasing airplanes from this ILFC um, that stands for International Lease Finance Corporation. Um, and, and again, it talks about this on the bottom of page 1199. But if we're Delta and we are leasing airplanes, then on this initial transaction, we would debit leased equipment, credit leased liability, right? And then International Lease Finance Corporation, ILFC, the leasor would debit lease receivable credit equipment. So it increases the receivable credits equipment uh, to get the equipment then off its books. So this says for a capital lease, and I mentioned this earlier, these four criteria. For capital lease, the FASB has identified four criteria, right? Four criteria. So number one, lease transfer ownership of the property to the leasee. 
Number two, lease contains a bargain purchase option. Um, on this bargain purchase option, and we're going to see this again, looking at it from the leasor's perspective, but this bargain purchase option um, allows the leasee to purchase the lease property for a price significantly lower than the property's expected fair value at the date the option becomes exercisable. So this is when the... Um, the, the purchase option, purchase option is less than the fair value at time of option. So maybe, you know, we might have a lease agreement that says we lease it for two years. After two years, we have the option to purchase it if that purchase option is less than the fair value at the end of the two years or less than the fair value at the time of the option, that's considered a bargain purchase option, right? The third criteria, lease term is equal to 75% or more of the estimated economic life of the lease property. So, you know, if, if we, if this, if this particular piece of equipment has an estimated life of five years, and we lease it for four years, then we're leasing it for, you know, 80% of its life, basically, right? Um, and then that's this fourth criteria, the present value of the minimum lease payments, excluding executory cost equals or exceeds 90% of the fair value of the lease property. So again, we'll talk about this more, um, but basically, um, you know, it, it does tell us in our book that, um, you know, at least one or more of these must be met for the lease to be considered a capital lease and, and to be recorded and treated as a uh, capital lease, right? Okay, so this illustration out of our book, this is um, on page 1201 um, it is where they're showing this. And it's just kind of a flow chart or how we can go through this process of determining whether it's a capital lease or an operating lease. So um, we start with the lease agreement over here. Um, is there a transfer of ownership? Yes. Is there a bargain purchase option? Yes, that's considered a, a capital lease. Is lease term greater than um, or equal to 75% of the economic life? Yes. Is present value of payments greater than or equal to 90% of the fair value? Yes, those are capital leases, right? However, if we answer no, um, is there a transfer of ownership? No. Is there a bargain purchase option? No. Is the lease term greater than or equal to 75% of the economic life? No. Is the present value of the payments greater than or equal to 90% of the fair value? No, it's considered an operating lease. Right. So just like it shows here, leases that do not meet any of the four criteria are accounted for as operating leases. In that case, um, when we have an operating lease, and I know that they show us this um, later on in the PowerPoint as well. Um, but when it's an operating lease, we are. Um, I was trying to find this too. Uh, in the book, I know that it's going to show it to us, but we're essentially debiting and an expense uh, crediting cash, right? When it's an operating lease, as opposed to capitalizing any of it. Remember, with the capital lease, we create a, a lease asset account, we create a lease liability account type deal. With an operating lease, we expense it uh, essentially. Okay, so uh, capitalization of criteria. So the transfer of ownership test, ownership transfer of the asset to the leasee uh, makes it a capital lease or then it would equal a capital lease. That bargain purchase option test, difference between the option price and the expected fair market value. And in fact, if we say that um, the option price is less than the expected fair market value, then it's a bargain purchase, right? Uh, economic life test, the 75% test, the lease term is more than 75% of the economic life of the asset. 
And then finally, um, the recovery of investment test, the 90% test. So present value of minimum lease payments is greater than or equal to 90% of the fair value of the asset. Um, uh, again, this includes the minimum lease payment, um, executory cost and discount rate. Um, and some of those executory costs, and I know we talk about these more as we continue through the chapter, but some of these executory costs include like insurance, maintenance, and tax expenses, right? So executory costs like insurance on the asset, um, maintenance on the asset, and tax uh, on the asset, right? Okay. All right, asset and liability accounted for differently. So asset and liability recorded at the lower of either number one, the present value of the minimum lease payments, excluding executory cost, or the fair market value of the leased asset at the inception of the lease. So whichever one is lower. The depreciation period, if lease transfers ownership, depreciate the asset up over the economic life of the asset using one of the depreciation methods that we've talked about before, straight line, sum of years, digits, double declining balance, units of production, whatever, right? If lease does not transfer ownership, depreciate over the term of the lease, okay? And then the effective interest method, um, we, we use this effective interest method to allocate each lease payment Right, so each lease payment we divide up or allocate between principal and interest. Okay, so here's our first example. And, and again, this is the example the book walks us through. So it's a bit of a long example, but that's okay. The next few slides are kind of gonna show us what goes along with this. So Caterpillar Financial Services Group, a subsidiary of Caterpillar and Sterling Construction Corporation sign a lease agreement dated January 1, 2017, that calls for Caterpillar to lease a front end loader to Sterling beginning January 1, 2017. The terms and provisions of the lease agreement and other pertinent data are as follows. The term of the lease is five years. The lease agreement is non-cancelable requiring equal rent payments of $25,981.62 at the beginning of each year, which makes it an annuity due. And so that's important because um, when we're looking at our present value tables, we're gonna have to look at present value annuity due. Uh, the loader has a fair value at the inception of the lease of 100,000, um, an estimated economic life of five years and no residual value. Sterling pays all of the executory costs directly to third parties, except for the property taxes of 2000 per year, which is included as part of its annual payment. So, you know, this payment basically, you know, if we take away the 2000, 23, right? But, but we include that 2000 in there, that's where they're getting that 25, 9, 8, 1, um, 6, 2. The lease contains no renewal options. The loader reverts to Caterpillar at the termination of the lease. Sterling's incremental borrowing rate is 11% per year. Uh, Sterling depreciates on a straight line basis, similar equipment that it owns. Caterpillar sets the annual rental um, to earn a rate of return on its investment of 10% per year. Sterling knows this fact. So, we're gonna use this 10% because that's the lower of the 10% or the 11%. So we're gonna use that 10%. Um, we depreciate on a straight line basis. So, you know, 100,000 divided by five basically um, is what we're gonna be looking at that. Um, so anyway, like I said, the next few slides are gonna walk us through um, examples of how we would handle this lease. So what type of lease is this? So um, capital lease versus operating lease. So transfer of ownership, no. Bargain purchase option, no. Uh, lease term is the lease term at least 75% of the economic life of the lease property. Yeah, because the lease term's five years, economic life is five years. So in fact, we're at 100% lease of the economic life. So yes. 
And then present value of minimum lease payments is equal to or greater than 90% of the fair market value. Yes, because present value is 100,000, fair market value is also 100,000. So yes, we will capitalize this lease, right? As long as one or more of these criteria are met, then we are able to capitalize the lease. So computing the present value of the minimum lease payment. So remember, the payment altogether, 25,981.62. We've got to subtract out those property taxes. So the minimum lease payment, 23,981.62. And then if we look at that present value factor, um, you know, interest rates, 10%, number of periods, in this case, years, number of years, five years. We're going to multiply that by that present value factor 4.16986 to get that 100,000, right? That's the present value um, of minimum lease payments. It says Sterling uses Caterpillar's implicit interest rate of 10% instead of its incremental borrowing rate of 11% because number one, it's lower. And number two, Sterling knows about it, right? So they, they're able to use that. Okay, Sterling records capital lease on its books um, on January 1, 2017 as a debit to leased equipment, a credit to lease liability. Uh, Sterling records the first lease payment on January 1, 2017 as follows. So we've got to debit the property tax expense for that 2000, debit the lease liability for 23,981.62 and then credit cash for the entire payment amount, uh, 25,981.62. Okay, and so looking at this amortization um, schedule, right? So we've got the carrying value, basically that beginning book value or that beginning carrying value of the lease, um, the annual lease payment, minus the executory cost. Uh, because this is the very first payment, we haven't incurred any interest yet. And so the reduction of the principal of the lease or the lease liability then is that difference um, between the payment and executory cost 23,981.62. And then the uh, carrying value of the lease is down to uh, 76,018.38. So at the end of 2017, however, we have incurred some interest expense, right? And so when we're thinking about that interest expense to get this number, we're taking that carrying value, 76,018.38 times 10%, right? That's how we're getting that interest expense. So remember, we don't make our payment until January 1. Uh, 2018, right? So when we record this interest expense, it's a debit to the interest expense, a credit to interest payable, and then we're going to pay next day, right? Basically, we're going to pay the next day on January 1, uh, 2018, essentially. All right, so the um, required entry to record depreciation, again, they use the straight line method, so we're debiting depreciation expense for 20,000. Um, you know, we get that number from here. Crediting accumulated depreciation for capital leases. And so from the perspective of the leasee, because it's a liability to us, we have to divide it up between the current liability and the non-current liability. Um, and we're gonna see this from the perspective of the leaseor as well. Um, but it's divided up into when we think about that payment um, that we have to make, it's divided into the portion of interest and then the portion that will reduce uh, lease liability. Those are the current liabilities. And then whatever will be left over, um, and if we go back, we see it here, um, at the end of the year, 5963860, that's what's our um, non-current liability, right? Okay. All right. So then January 2018, when we make this payment, um, and again, we're looking at this information here, right? When we make this payment, January 1, 2018, we're crediting cash for the payment amount. We see that here. 
Um, we're debiting property tax expense for those executory costs. We see that here. We are debiting um, interest payable because now we're paying this interest expense here. And again, the reduction in the lease liability, um, debiting lease liability for that amount that we've calculated there. And that leads that carrying value again down to 59,638.60. Okay, operating method um, for the leasee, you know, again, the previous slides, we looked at the capital lease uh, method and the capital lease entries. But now thinking about an operating lease, if it does not meet those four criteria, right? So uh, four criteria, it doesn't meet the transfer of ownership test. It doesn't meet the bargain purchase option test. It doesn't meet the economic life test. It doesn't meet the recovery of investment test. Then it's classified as an operating lease. So the leasee assigns rent to the periods benefiting from the use of the asset and ignores in the accounting any commitments to make future payments. So on our illustration, it says assume, assume Sterling accounts for the lease as an operating lease. Sterling records the payment on January 1, 2017 as follows. So again, rent expense, debit, rent expense, credit cash, right? And probably, you know, we probably want to be even a little bit more specific. And maybe we would want to say like equipment rental expense is what I would prefer just looking at it because again, rent expense could be like what we pay to occupy our building type thing, right? So I'd like to say equipment rental expense, but you know, either way, uh, debiting and expense. Okay, accounting by the lease source. So again, now we're gonna look at it from Caterpillar's perspective, right? So benefits to the lease or um, interest revenue, um, tax incentives, high residual value. Um, it talks about these, um, let's see here, where are we at now? Um, starting at the top of page um, 1,210 or 1,210. So interest revenue, leasing is a form of financing, banks, captives, and independent leasing companies find leasing attractive because it provides competitive interest margins. Uh, tax incentives, in many cases, companies that lease cannot use the tax benefit of the asset, but leasing allows them to transfer such tax benefits to another party. Um, high residual value, another advantage to the leasor is the return of the property at the end of the lease term. Residual values can produce very large profits, right? So the economics of leasing, a leaseor determines the amount of the rental, basing it on the rate of return, the implicit rate needed to justify leasing the asset. If the residual, if a residual value is involved, whether guaranteed or not, the company would not have to recover as much from the lease payments. And then as I mentioned at the beginning of the um, slides or the beginning of the presentation, classification of leases by the leaseor are either um, direct financing leases, operating leases, or sales type um, leases. And so the next few slides are gonna walk us through um, examples of each of these. All right, so classification of the leases by the lease or so um, the classification criteria um, on this, it says, uh, for accounting purposes, the leaser may classify leases as one or more of the following. And that's why we said, you know, direct financing leases, operating leases, sales type leases, right? Um, so if at the date of inception, the leaser agrees to lease, agrees to a lease that meets one or more of the group one criteria, and both of the group two criteria, the leaser shall classify and account for the arrangement as a direct financing lease. So if it meets at least one of these and both of these, then it's considered a direct financing lease, right? And then as it shows down here, and, and you'll notice that these criteria are the same from the perspective of the lease or, or uh, excuse me, from the perspective of the leasee. So the leasee transfers, uh, the lease transfers ownership of property to the leasee. 
The lease contains a bargain purchase option. The lease term is equal to 75% or more of the economic, uh, estimated economic life of the lease property or the present value of minimal le uh, minimum lease payments ex excluding executory cost equals or exceeds 90% of the fair value of the lease property. So if, if at least one of those are present um, and then both in group two, so collectability of the payments required from the leasee is reasonably predictable and no important uncertainties surround the amount of unreal reimbursable costs yet to be incurred by the lease or under the lease. So leaser's performance is substantially complete or future costs are reasonably predictable. So if, if we meet those criteria, so one from group two, both from group, uh, one from group one, <laughs> both from group two, then we consider it a direct financing lease, right? But as it shows here, a sales type lease involves a manufacturer's or dealer's profit and a direct financing lease does not. So that's one of the main um, differences between a sales type lease and a direct financing lease. A sales type lease, we've got some type of profit on top of the cost of goods, uh, essentially, is what is what we're going to see on this. So, um, but where the leasee would would capitalize the lease, the leasor would consider it direct financing um, type deal. All right, so here's kind of a flow chart or how we walk through um, the decision making process on how to consider this. So, um, again, you know, starting with the lease agreement, does lease meet any of group one criteria? If yes, is it collect is collectability of lease payments reasonably certain? Yes. Is a leaser's performance substantially complete? Yes. Um, does the asset fair value equal lesser's book value? Yes. Direct financing lease, right? If no, if the asset's fair value does not equal the leaser's book value, then no, it's a sales type lease, right? Or if any one of these are not, um, so does the lease meet any of the group one criteria? No, it's an operating lease. Is, a, is collectability of the lease payments reasonably certain? No, then it's an operating lease. Is the leaser's uh, performance substantially complete? No, then it's an operating lease, right? So. Like it shows here at the bottom, a leaseor may classify a lease as an operating lease, but the leasee may classify the same lease as a capital lease. Okay. Anyway, that is on page um, 1212, if anybody wanted to look at that further. Direct financing method um, from the leaseor's perspective. Again, when we think about direct financing from the leaseor's perspective, this would be usually, generally speaking, a capital lease from the leasee's perspective. So in substance, the financing of an asset purchased by the leasee, um, because for example, there is a transfer of ownership, there's a bargain purchase option, blah, 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 right? Like we've talked about before. Leaser records a lease receivable instead of a lease asset. Uh, receivable is the present value of the minimum lease payments. And so again, based on this Caterpillar example, now looking at it from the leaser's perspective, Caterpillar Financial Services Corporation, a subsidiary of Caterpillar and Sterling Construction Corporation sign a lease agreement dated January 1, 2017 that calls for Caterpillar to lease a front end loader to Sterling beginning January 1, 2017. The terms and provisions of the lease agreement and other pertinent data follow. Again, we've read through this all before, but before when we looked at this, we were looking at it from Sterling, who was the leasee, right? We were looking at it from Sterling's uh, perspective. Um, now we're looking at it from Caterpillar's perspective, Caterpillar being the leaseor, right? Okay, so the term of the lease is five years beginning January 1, 2017, non-cancelable and requires equal rent payments of um, $25,981.62. Remember, this is also the estimated life, also estimated life. <laughs> 
So we already know that it's going to meet one of the group one criteria, right? Um, payments include 2000 of executive uh, executory costs, which are property taxes. The equipment front end loader has a cost of 100,000 to Caterpillar and a fair value at the inception of the lease of 100,000. So again, 100,000, these are equal 100,000. So this is definitely a direct type, right? Not sales type. Because if it was sales type, Caterpillar, it would have a, um, a fair value of higher than, or excuse me, the cost, right? But basically we'd be, we'd be leasing it or be able to sell it for more than it costs type deal, right? Um, Caterpillar incurred no initial direct cost in negotiating and closing the lease transaction. The lease contains no renewal option. Uh, collectability is reasonably assured and Caterpillar incurs no additional cost. Um, Caterpillar sets annual lease payments to ensure rate of return of 10% on its investment. So computing the lease payments, again, we saw this from Sterling's perspective um, earlier on in the slide, fair value of leased equipment um, versus the present value or of residual value amount to be recovered by lease or through lease payments. So there's no difference. So we know this is a direct type lease as opposed to the sales type lease. Um, five beginning of the year lease payments to yield a 10% return. Um, okay, and again, remember because we're making the payments at the beginning of the year, we look at that annuity due um, table, right? Okay. Uh, the lease meets the criteria for classification as a direct financing lease for several reasons. Number one, the lease term exceeds 75% of the equipment's uh, estimated economic life. The lease is for five years. The economic life is for five years. So it exceeds 75%. In fact, it's 100% of the economic life, right? The present value of the minimum lease payments exceeds 90% of the equipment's fair value. Collectability of the payments is reasonably assured. Um, Caterpillar incurs no further costs. So just like it shows here, it is not a sales type lease because there's no difference between the fair value, 100,000 of the loader and Caterpillar's cost, 100,000. Now, if the cost was 80,000, for example, then, and, and you know, and we're leasing it basically for 100, right? Um, then, then it would be considered a, a sales type lease. All right, so computation of lease receivable. Again, we've got the total cash payment that Caterpillar is going to get every January, 25,981.62. We have to subtract the executory cost from there. So um, the payment after the executory cost, 23,981.62. And then again, we're multiplying it by that present value factor. Um, so we're gonna value this or we're gonna put this lease receivable on our books at 100,000. Caterpillar records the lease of the asset and resulting receivable on January 1, 2017 as follows. So lease receivable 100,000, debit, and then credit equipment 100,000. All right, so it's walking us through now this amortization schedule. So remember the beginning carrying value is um, 100,000. And then when we think about this first year payment on January 1, we subtract out that 2,000, that's gonna reduce the lease receivable um, by 23,981.62, right? So that first payment, when we record that first payment, it's gonna be a debit to cash for the entire amount of the payment, a credit to lease receivable for the amount of the reduction, and then a credit to um, property taxes payable for the executory cost there, right? All right, now at the end of the year, um, remember when we looked at this from the leasee's perspective, at the end of the year, it was a debit to interest expense, a credit to interest liability. 
But now looking at it from the Lee Soar's perspective on December 31, 2017, Caterpillar recognizes the interest revenue during the first year through the following entry. So again, we're looking at this information now, right? Because we've went through 2017 and now we are owed some interest. And so we see that interest receivable um, amount there. And so we're debiting interest receivable, crediting interest revenue. Uh, oop, hold on, let me go back. Um, so illustration 21-15 shows the asset section as it relates to the lease transactions. Member, from the leasee's perspective, um, we had to record a current liability, uh, a non-current liability. Now from the leaseor's perspective, again, they have to record the current asset um, that's going to be converted to cash within the next year, basically in the non-current asset, the remaining term of the lease. All right, now we see uh, January 1, 2018, Caterpillar records the following. So again, this is when we make, um, we or we receive the payment from Sterling, right? We're still looking at this information here. Uh, Sterling's paying us a cash payment, $25,981.62. Um, we're going to credit interest receivable now because we're, we're receiving the payment for um, 7601.84. And again, this reduces the lease receivable, um, 1637978 is how that would look. Oh, hot dog. And then property taxes um, payable because Sterling pays us the 2000, but we got to turn around and pay that to property taxes. We don't get to keep that type deal. Okay, now the oop, hot dog, the following year. Um, now, when we're recording on December 31st, 2018, now we're looking at this information. And so we've got the um, debit to interest receivable, credit to interest revenue for the amount of interest at that point. And, and again, we get this number from taking that carrying value 5963.60. Right. Okay. All right. So accounting by the lease or for the operating um, leases or the operating method records each rental receipt as rental revenue as opposed to um, lease receivable, right? Depreciates leased asset in the normal manner. So here's an example of that. It says, assume Caterpillar accounts for the lease as an operating lease it records the cash rental receipt as follows. So debit, cash, credit, rental revenue. Um, and then depreciation, same thing. We're taking the uh, beginning book value of the asset divided by useful life in periods, right? So 20,000 per year. Okay, finally, the sales type leases. And it starts talking about these sales type leases um, on page uh, 1222. So um, on that page, it says, as already indicated, the primary difference between direct financing lease and a sales type lease is the manufacturer's or dealer's gross profit or loss. Um, in a sales type lease, the leaser records the sales price of the asset, the cost of goods sold, and related inventory reduction, and the lease receivable. The information necessary to record the sales type lease um, is going to be shown in the next couple few slides. So when we think about lease receivable or um, from the lease source perspective net investment, it's the present value of the minimum lease payments plus the present value of any unguaranteed residual value. The lease receivable therefore includes the present value of the residual value, whether guaranteed or not. The sales price of the asset is going to be equal to the present value of the minimum lease payments. Um, and then cost of goods sold, the cost of the asset to the leaseor, less the present value of any unguaranteed residual value. So here's our example um, that your book walks us through. So to illustrate a sales type lease with a guaranteed residual value and with an unguaranteed residual value, 
assume the same facts as in the preceding direct financing lease situation. The estimated residual value is 5,000, the present value of which is $3,104.60. And the leased equipment has an $85,000 cost to the dealer, um, Caterpillar. Assume that the fair market value of the residual value 3,000 at the end of the lease term. So computation of the lease amounts by Caterpillar um, for this financial sales type lease, right? So if it has this guaranteed residual value, the lease receivable would be 100,000. The sales price of the lease uh, is also 100,000. The cost of goods sold, right? That's, that's the sales price of the lease. Cost of goods sold, 85,000. Gross profit then is 15,000, right? It is what that would look like. All right, um, in, in this case, and, and I do believe it does show us this on the next slide, but in this case, for example, um, we would be, you know, debiting cost of goods sold. And here, let me put it over here. So just a little bit more specific. We would be debiting cost of goods sold for this amount, right? We would be debiting lease receivable um, for this amount. We would be crediting sales revenue uh, for the sales price. And then we'd be um, basically crediting inventory. We'd also have to credit inventory over here for the, um, for the 85,000 um, 85, reduction in inventory, right? On the other hand, on if it has an unguaranteed residual value, the lease receivable still the same, still 100,000, but the sales price of the asset then is adjusted for the present value of the residual value, right? Remember this 3104 is the present value of residual value. Um, is, is what we would record the sales revenue at. So cost of goods sold would be recorded a little bit differently as well because we take that 85,000 again minus the present value of the residual value. All right, so in this case, um, you know, we would debit cost of goods sold here. Um, we would debit lease receivable again for the same amount, 100,000. We would credit sales revenue here, and then we'd also have to credit inventory for the $85,000 reduction. And so it's showing us those here, right? So here are all of our journal entries. Um, if it's a guaranteed residual value, um, I'm not going to walk through every single one of these. We're going to get practice with some of these in class together, but I just kind of wanted to show you. Um, and I know on the last slide, I, I, I put those in, right? So those are our journal entries. Again, if there's a guaranteed residual value, here are our journal entries if there is not a guaranteed um, residual value. Okay. Okay. Anyway, we're gonna get practice, of course, like we always do with um, these in class together. Um, finally, disclosing lease data. Um, so just like it tells us in our book, uh, according to FASB, the lease data that needs to be disclosed is the general description of the nature of leasing arrangements, the nature, timing, and amount of cash inflows and outflows associated with the leases, including payments to be paid or received for each of the five succeeding years, the amount of lease revenues and expenses reported in the income statement each period, description and amounts of leased assets by major balance sheet classifications and related liabilities, or the amounts uh, receivable and unearned revenues under the lease agreements. All right, anyway, we're going to of course, get more practice and talk about this more in class together. That was our last slide. Okay, so as always, guys, once you have a chance to view this recorded lecture, read the chapter, um, let me know if you have any questions, send me an email or see me in class, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>